The, the lesson is for that problem with that determinant that we talked about last time. Um, so I'm going to go there. Oh, there's a typo here in this is my solutions. Anybody recognized? Here obviously it should be from 1 to t, not from 0 to t. So I have, I have a few. Um, I didn't change, I didn't correct that, but um, it was more about uh, time dependent um, uh, linear system, so non, non autonomous linear system that looks like this, right? P prime equals A times P, and A is changing with time. Okay, and we saw this to come from the variational equation. So if you have a, um, even for a, for a, for a uh, autonomous system, you end up with equations like this, right? Because you, what you do is you, for an autonomous nonlinear system, x prime equals f of x, you take a solution, Okay. Um, of interest to you. Um, to pick, and then linearize about x of t. What does that mean? Well, that basically means that you have. Um, You linearize at each point, for, for each time t, you linearize about, about, about the state at which that system is. So it's the derivative of f, right, at x of t. So that's is going to be a matrix, and that certainly is going to be time dependent, right? Unless the solution that you picked is, is an equilibrium, right? So this is. And then you consider the system that is um, measuring what? As I said, it's an approximate uh, sort of measure or the solutions to this non-autonomous <laughs> linear equation measure about uh, how much is sort of a solution changing so x of t is this, right? So it's depending on which direction you pick, u naught, it basically you find u of t to be, you know, possibly bigger. I, I draw it like it could really be smaller, it could be actually be uh, a lot growing, right? So remember if I have a, a um, linear system like this, if you had constant coefficients, for instance, you would be either going in or going out or being periodic. So I don't know, it could be much smaller here, right? And the idea is that if you do this, if you track this sort of, this would be u of x, so this point would be x of t plus u of t, then this would be an approximate solution for the actual, for the true solution that starts at this point, right? So in a way it's a, it, it would be, that's legitimate to call it a, a linearization about a, a solution like this, but it makes a lot more sense when the solution that you pick is an equilibrium, right? So again, if, if x is an equilibrium, in particular if x, we talked about this last time excuse me, x star, so I'm going to use star to indicate is an equilibrium so what does it mean it's an equilibrium? it means that plugged in the right side of, the, of, the, of your system gives you zero 
Right? That's how you find equilibrium. Then A, which is the linearization about that solution, it means it's just the matrix, the Jacobian. So it's just the Jacobian of F at X star. Okay? Now, let me just go back and, and sort of see this picture again in that, in that scenario. In that scenario, when you have an equilibrium, so a steady state, a fixed solution. Um, you can also think about it in, in the following sense. You can use Taylor approximation for f near x equals x star to approximate the right hand side so let's let's just do it I mean that's pretty heuristic because it's not there I mean this is not actually the proof but um, how can you approximate a function. If, if it's a one variable, then you can use the, the linearization. Or the, the Taylor approximation is what? Is a f of x star plus the derivative at x star, right? Times x minus x star. Okay? Now, if F has n components, so it's a system, it comes from a system, the right-hand side of a system, then this will be a vector, right? This will be a vector, and this will be what? A matrix, so n by n matrix, right? So this is n by 1, you know, the n by 1, n by n, and this is n by 1. Okay? Well, so what do you what do you see? Well, this guy is actually zero. That's that's what we said. X star is a fixed is a, is a equilibrium, right? So you see that f of x, the right hand side of this equation, is approximately equal to the just the product of this. So if we call this to be well, call this to be a, and call this to be U. Right? Then you can say that the solutions would have to satisfy this equation, sort of. Well, you're changing the system. You're taking the system from being uh, x prime equals f of x to what? To x prime being a times u. But you wanted something in terms of u. So how can you change x prime? You see, you don't want to write x prime equals a times u because u is the new variable. So, um, so x minus x star equals u means x is x star plus u. So it means x prime is u prime. Right? Because x is fixed. I'm talking these are functions of t, but x star is fixed. It's a it's a it's a fixed vector. So x prime is u prime. So by putting this two uh, terms together, x, u prime equals a u, you've actually created a linear system, right? In this case, a constant coefficient. And that's exactly the linearization about that fixed point.
But of course, um, the picture, the solutions of this will actually be important around zero, around the equal zero. Okay. Now, so uh, this was pretty much mentioned last time, but I wanted to bring this up again because when um, when you linearize about a solution that's not con not necessarily equilibrium, for instance, if it's a periodic solution, sometimes, as I said, we're going to have to linearize about a periodic solution to see our solutions away from that approaching the solution, or are they, is it repelling? You know, what what is happening? Um, then this is a time-dependent one, and this is going to be um, a family of, of matrices that don't commute. I don't think there's any... If you take the Jacobian of that right-hand side at different points, that you would have any sort of commutation. That is, right? So, so, so when we talk about a When we talk about you know a statement that we make, right? Like in this case, we made a statement, you know, take a continuous family of, of matrices and then look at this differential equation, right? We shouldn't really assume that they they are commuting, okay? Well, so last time I, sh I showed you, if A is constant, then then it's easy to kind of get the trace of A into the picture, right? But if A is not constant and A of T are not commuting, then it's a lot more difficult. And I have, I'm not going to go through everything here, but it's, I wanted to kind of uh, um, start appreciating how different everything is when you talk about matrices. So when you do matrix calculus rather than vector calculus. Okay. When you do vector calculus, it's just like, well, that's calculus three, right? When you do matrix calculus, is is it's totally different because you can no longer swap things. You know, you cannot uh, do commutations. Um, so let's see. I have two methods here that I I, I put here uh, as proofs. One is kind of really heavily uh, depending on linear algebra. So if you didn't have a linear algebra course, a solid linear algebra course, then it's going to be pretty hard But to follow this. But if you do, then I think that's a very good illustration of how linear algebra is really uh, relevant. Um, in particular, I just want to point uh, out this thing. So if you start with an initial matrix, you know, that has n columns, right? And let's say that matrix is invertible. So the determinant is not zero, right? Then what you'd like to do is you'd like to see how the determinant of the matrix P, P that satisfies that equation, evolves with time, right? So as I said, when you, when you differentiate the determinant, determinant of a matrix, where t shows up everywhere, I mean, is is by product rule taking the determinant of each of one column at a time. Excuse me, the determinant of the derivative. Excuse me, of taking the derivative of one column at a time. So, for instance, here would be the determinant of the first column, and then the other columns are left unchanged, right? It's just product rule. Then plus plus the determinant of the second column differentiated and the others left unchanged and so forth, right? Well, since each column is a solution of that A of T X, right? Then you can replace A of T instead of this derivative, A of T X1 Xn. So this is there's no linear algebra here, um, really. It's just the determinant of A of T times the first column, right? And all the other columns are left unchanged. So it's a sum of determinants, okay? Well, a sum of determinants cannot really be... The sum of two determinants is not a determinant of a sum or anything, right? Um, so what do you do after that? Well, somehow you have to recover the trace 
the trace of that matrix A, okay? And here's where linear algebra really comes into the picture. Um, and again, if you didn't have linear algebra, I think I would say maybe skip this part, but... Um, You see, the main question is what happens with the with determinant. You see, now I fix a t, so I don't. This is going to work for any fixed t, so I don't care what t is. I can say t equals zero. I just call this a matrix B A of t for a fixed t, right? It's just a matrix B, and I have this n columns. And if I take that sum of determinants, it turns out that is the trace of this times the determinant of those terms of those columns. Okay. That's a statement that one has to uh, see, basically prove this. Um, would you agree that this is true if B is diagonal? Well, if B is diagonal, so it has only one entry on the first column and, and row, right? Then B of x1 is just going to be that thing times x1. That, that constant, B11, for instance, right? So B11 comes in front. Same thing with, with the, all the other terms, right? So the determinant of this is going to be common factor, and what's left is the sum of those diagonal terms. Okay? So this happens if B is diagonal. The question is, why does it happen when B is not necessarily diagonal? Uh, well, and this is where talking about basis is... is um, is relevant. If, if, I, if I have sort of a linearly independent, if I, if I assume that first determinant initially is non-zero, then this set of columns is linearly independent. So it's a basis for Rn. So I can write B of x1 as a linear combination of x1 through xn. I can write B of x2 as a linear combination. How do we call this writing the action of a matrix on a basis in terms of that basis. Anybody? It's basically representing a linear transformation in a basis, okay, and possibly a different basis than the, the the canonical basis, right? So you can change the basis, the linear transformation that is B action of B on a, on, a, on a vector is actually going to give you a different matrix, right? How, what's the relationship between those two matrices when you change a basis? The two matrices are so-called similar, and you've seen that basically similarity is, um, is this thing. It says that there is a T, that T inverse BT is actually that B, okay? Turns out that for two matrices that are similar, the traces are the same. That's a good exercise too, linear algebra exercise. Why why are these two matrices uh, traces similar? Uh, excuse me, um, traces are the same for similar matrices. And then you just have to basically plug in, like I said, um, that representation of B of x one in here. And you see, every time you have, well, the determinant is linear in this first component. Why is it linear in the first column? Why is the terminal li linear? That is, if you add two, if I have, if the first column is a sum of two things, I can separate it in the sum of two determinants with. No, any, uh, I'm, just just any like if I put two columns here, and of course. B is going to be the sum of all that, right? But I'm saying just two of them. If I put two two columns and I take the determinant of a matrix that has the first column as a sum of two, well, the determinant is it can be. How do you compute a determinant? You you expand by the first column, for instance, right? So when you expand by the first column, you actually get the entry in each of that each entry in that column times the cofactor, right? So it's, then it can be factor out or multiply through, sort of, right? So it is it is the case that when I plug in, as you can see here, 
when I plug in b of x1 to be b1, 1, x1, plus b1, 2, 2, 1, x2, and so forth, that's going to split into n determinants. But like b, if I put x2 here and I have an x2 here, these are linearly dependent. So the determinant is determinant of a matrix is zero if, the, if there are two. Well, if there are two linearly dependent columns, then you have zero. So you see, you only get one term out of that n terms. Everything else is zero. Okay. So that's how you get this one, and then everything else. So in the end, you put them together and you get the trace. Okay. Well, it's the trace of this new matrix, which equals the trace of B. Okay. It's kind of a complicated, and I haven't. Well, next we talk about um, what happens if if you start with a matrix that is has zero determinant, right? This means if those columns are linearly dependent, that means they don't form a basis. Okay, then it's it's actually more complicated. So um, then I spend a little bit of time here to talk about this. Then the rank of the of that matrix becomes important. Okay. So what is the rank? Number of maximum number of maximum number of linearly dependent vectors, right? Anyway, in all of those cases, that relation is satisfied. It's actually a very good exercise in linear algebra to go through this. I think I'm going to skip all of that. There's another method which I've actually seen somebody use, but I want to know where. Uh, it actually, is a very powerful method, and that's the method of choice if you want it. But it's it involves the rational derivatives. Okay, what on earth is that? Um, so I don't know how much time I can spend, but. Um, you see, when you have a function of several variables, you know what directional derivative is, right? You say, if it's a function of two variables, then you have, you can differentiate a function at a point in a certain direction, right? And how do you differentiate that? Well, imagine these are not, not matrices, but these are numbers. These are vectors, right? In R2 or something. Have you seen this notation? Well, you've seen it in Cal 3, but you've, you've, you've lost it. Uh, it's the directional derivative of the function at the point in the direction of B, for instance. Right? So if A were a vector and B were another vector, well, excuse me, if A were a point, right, and you want to evaluate the direction, the derivative of that function starting at that point going in the direction of B. Well, there's nothing but evaluating the function at A plus TB. That's what it is in that direction, right? You start at A and you go in the direction of B. And you differentiate with respect to time and evaluate at time zero. Okay, that's a very uh, powerful tool here. Um, and it turns out that this is true not only for vectors, but also matrices, in fact, lots of other kind of um, functions. So you see I put a function here as sort of a uh, quote unquote, but it's a, it's a function that takes a matrix into a number, right? That's what the determinant is. It takes a matrix into a number. So you're asking, what is the derivative of this? Because in the end, you're going to want the, der the determinant along a path, right, P of T. So the first question is to compute this, be able to compute this. And the computation is not too hard. Um, but the more, uh, maybe I'll go back, but the more important thing is to apply this as a chain rule. So what's a, what would be a chain rule if you take the derivative of the determinant of a matrix that depends on T? Well, I claim that this is the directional derivative of this determinant function at that point P, P of T, in the direction of the derivative. Okay? 
and we can sit and, arg and argue about it if you want. Anyway, if if you kind of agree with that, well, accept that, I mean, this is nothing but the chain rule, I mean, believe me, it's nothing but the chain rule in the fence here. Uh, then you can use this formula for directional derivative. So you see how the directional derivative is? At least in the case when A is not invertible, it's actually um, how, how would you differentiate that thing, by the way? Yeah. How come, how come I get, well, okay. So first you see, I kind of isolate determinant of A, assuming that it's not zero, so I can invert A. So this is just a constant, right? Comes in front. But how do I take the derivative of the determinant of identity? That's the identity matrix plus T times some other matrix. Why is this a trace? Anybody can tell me? It's not an obvious thing, actually. You have to imagine, basically, this matrix. You see, this matrix has one, zero, zero everywhere else, right? One on diagonal. And then there's this T's everywhere, right? When you expand that determinant, what's the only terms that survive when you take the derivative and set it equal to zero? It's only the terms that have T in it, right? And nothing else. Well, how can you get a determin How can you get terms that have t in this determinant and nothing, not t squared and so forth? Well, you really have to get the terms that only one of them. It's like a, it's like a huge foiling, right? You have to foil the whole determinant and kind of see uh, that only the ones that are on the diagonal of this matrix A inverse B are survive as coefficients of t. So anyway, when you plug this in here, you get, what do you get? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you don't take the root of the determinant of the identity. It's the determinant of identity plus t times that. So it's, first you have to look at this determinant, expand it, like imagine how you know, it has ones, and then it has t plus t times something, right? And then off the diagonal is only t times something. When you start multiplying through, you're asking what are the terms that only have t as a first you know, power? Because everything else either is going to be killed by the, term, by the derivative or by the setting t equals zero. Okay, so that's how only the trace survives. Um, okay, so applying this sort of in this situation, then we give you this formula, which is inverse times p prime, and um, you replace p prime with a p, and then again you use the fact that this is similar to this, right? There is something to the inverse times a times p. So the traces are equal. Okay. Now, this again works when p is not invertible. Uh, when p is invertible, when the determinant is not zero. How do you do it when p is when, when the determinant is zero? This I haven't included, so I'll, I'll. There's hard stuff. There's hard things in in um, in metrics calculus. There are hard things. There are things that are not obvious. Okay. Um, that one needs to worry about. So, so again, I haven't shown you, and I'll leave this as a well fun project for spring break. To tell me how is this directional derivative different, or what is the directional derivative if the matrix A is not invertible? So you cannot take the A inverse. There's no A inverse, okay? And I can tell you the answer to determine the direction of the will be zero, but why is it zero? It's your, it's your, um, I'll leave it to you. Okay, there's another thing that, and again, 
I run into the risk of, of getting into various, various, all of these details, and then I get homeworks that. Um, so there, there's more basic stuff that you should really worry about understanding than this. Okay. Um, again, if you didn't have linear algebra, this probably looks just gibberish. Um, if you didn't have a, a, like a good solid course on calculus three. <laughs> This will be a little gibberish, right? So you, have, I mean, it, it will take some time to kind of get it. But yeah, so with that, it should have just been constant a. That's really what. Yeah. Sorry to ask. Um, no, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> we took the It's always the case. So that's I'm sorry, which one? You mean the statement of the, of the problem or? You think of that exponential thing? Oh, yeah. Well, okay, right. You, I mean, all these problems, you pretty much have to see what you need, where you need to get, and see if you can get there. Um, this, this was, I think, that you're referring to. Um, Um, not for matrices, not for matrices. It's for the scalar, okay? But um, this is the kind of, so that's why I said I should have um, um, stated for constant A, because that should have been the starting point, okay? So if, if it was like this, then, then you would have, uh, where was that? Yeah, basically that these two are the same, okay? But yeah, it's not necessarily that it's it's not on every wall. It's not something that it's in a table of important things that you have to know in life. Um, but it is something that you can very easily check. Okay, so that's the whole thing: is you don't, you know, you see a statement, you, you have to be able to uh, decide: is it true? Is it true only in certain cases? Is it true always? And you really have everything, uh, all the tools, right? Well, I mean, like we said last time, if it's if A is Jordan block, you know, if it's upper triangular, basically, then you can easily verify this. Um, okay, but if it's time dependent. Um, so non-autonomous uh, systems are actually a lot more difficult. Okay. Um, I can go on and on because this is actually a whole. You know, that's that's how things go here, uh, guys. So you start with linear systems, okay, in two dimensions. Now you start, okay, you start with one dimension, okay, and it all looks nice and easy, right? Then you build and say, okay, what happens with linear systems in two dimensions? Okay, you start having this, depending on eigenvalues and how you know they are, right? You have different pictures, right? Spiraling in, spiraling out. Okay, well, what happens if you have five dimensions, right? Linear system in five dimensions. Well, you can have extra complications, right? Okay, now we made a big jump to nonlinear systems, and uh, even in two dimensions, you know, we can see. Actually, you'll see. 
uh, this handout is, is one of those situations. Everything can, you know, every kind of behavior can actually happen, right? Um, this is for autonomous nonlinear systems where you can see the face portrait, right? Why? Because what you what you draw is the what the solution will do always, even if it starts now or starts in ten minutes or right? The f direction field doesn't change, right? You make a direction field and then you can you know start playing with fitting with curves, right? All right. So this is basically three courses. You can spend three courses on this. Then you go to non-autonomous systems where what happens? You, even in two dimensions, you can no longer see the, 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 the face portrait. Okay? And nothing really extends uh, trivially. Like, it's not just a very simple extension that, that happens. Okay? Um, is there anything past that? Um, well, of course, autonomous systems that are linear, that's kind of, you can say it's easier than non-autonomous, -auton what did I say, non-autonomous, so time-dependent linear systems, you can say, well, they're pretty much the same level of complexity as, well, there's certainly, let me, let me draw a diagram, a diagram here, and that's, Okay, so so this is going to be uh, linear systems. Okay, what's the complication can occur? Well, you can have autonomous, nonlinear systems, right? Or you can have non-autonomous linear systems okay uh, well there, there could actually be with some external for, forcing but you know we haven't really talked about that or it could also be for for uh, autonomous so let, let me not talk about forcing let's just talk about homogeneous okay and then of course the full-blown Nonlinear systems, non-autonomous. In which the right hand side not only depends on nonlinearly on, on the axis, but also on t. Okay, so that's so. But any departure from this. It's a zoo. So uh, we're, now we, we're kind of talking about autonomous systems, right? And, and equilibria, and we're going to see some stability and stuff, right? Um, we're not going to talk a lot about that. So that, that homework, that question was, I don't know, kind of uh, make you aware of this problem, of the problems that appear in non autonomous systems. Okay? And we're not going to talk about a lot of this either. So we're not going to talk about a lot of time dependent because they're just a lot more har harder to do, right? Because it's it's just um, I mean there's a trick of actually treating any non-autonomous system as an autonomous if you introduce um, Remember that was one, one uh, homework before again that had made no sense at that time, but we talked about it. We said that if it's a non-autonomous first-order equation, then you can make it into a system by saying, well, add one more variable that will be exactly t. So whose derivative is one? So in effect, you're making this now a autonomous system, but with one extra dimension, right? So because of that. The study of this pretty much is encapsulated in this study of autonomous nonlinear systems. Okay, so that's where we're focusing in. 
Okay, so but I, I, I don't like this kind of diagrams because they're not, they don't tell you much. Um, but just good to know where, where you're, um, you know, where the problems, you're in a much more difficult world in this here than anything before. Okay. Um, so just to illustrate that, um, let's talk a little bit about um, bifurcations. So there was one homework problem which I assigned before we even talked about bifurcations. And uh, well, it was also number nine, which I said to discard. In fact, I put it for the next homework. Um, but there was one problem that I uh, mentioned, and it's in the solutions here. That has this one here. That it's a nonlinear system, right? Everybody recognizes it's a nonlinear system, and it has a parameter. Parameter. Parameter A is is assumed to be constant, but it could change. You know. Um, and it would yield a different system, right? So uh, the question is, what kind of, what kind of, well, what can you say about this system? And the best thing is first focus on the equilibria, right? Equilibria are found very easily, right? So the right hand side equals zero, and in this in this case you can do it explicitly. You get two values for a for uh, for x, depending on a, right? If a is in a certain range, like bigger than a fourth, a quarter, then there is no equilibrium because there is no x, right? If you tell me that you get complex and you get two complex equilibria, that's again something I crossed, you know, heavily. Okay, right? Because in the phase plane, in the phase plane, right, we only have x one and or x and y as real numbers, okay? So we're asking what kind of solutions do we have? Well, we don't have any real uh, solutions to this. So no equilibria, one equilibria, and two equilibria. So as if you imagine as, you know, for whatever reason that parameter will, will change its values, right? Then you could actually suddenly be, uh, find yourself in a situation where, whereas, let's say, before you didn't have any equilibria, like this is a, no equilibria. A, I think I chose one, one half. Okay, and you, s I mean, of course, I only pick this window, right? So maybe there are equilibria outside, but I know because we did the computation, right? But in this window, you, you know, you don't see an equilibrium, right? You see the solutions just, you see how they follow, kind of try to align around a certain path, okay? Um, but if, if A changes, so you can imagine as A changes that this uh, direction field changes, right? Now, this is not really to say that it's time dependent. You should make that distinction. Of course, if A were a function of time, yeah, then you have a non-autonomous system. But this is not that case. This is, you fix a value for A, and you run time with that fixed value of A, right? So maybe the best way to, uh, to uh, think about it is uh, that fix the value of A for a while, right? And see what happens to the solution. Then change to another value of Y, of A. And you can see if, if you run into the value one quarter, you actually have the same behavior, but what happens with points that start here? Where are they going to go? Huh? They look like they are going to squeeze towards that equilibrium point. Because certainly there is an equilibrium point. Certainly a point starting here will stay here. Point starting here will go here. But point starting here, I think you can see the direction still go to infinity, right? So it's kind of a... Um, how do you call this equilibrium? Stable or sink? I would call it semi-stable, right? See, because on certain directions it actually goes towards. Is that right? Yeah. 
but on the other half it goes away, right? And how do you convince yourself of that? Well, the only way, I mean at this point, is to take the linearization around that equilibrium. Okay? Then if you run, if you, if, you, if you change that parameter even more, in this case make it less than a quarter, like say zero, then two equilibrium pop out, right? And you see, what's the behavior of the system? Well, if you start on this side, you still go along that path, right? But if you start here, you don't go towards this, you go towards this other one. Here, go towards that one, right? So this is really a, saw, uh, a saddle, right? Yeah, because there is one direction that you still can go in. There's one direction that you go out, and then of course the other ones, and, okay? And all this is actually encapsulated in the linearization, okay? So when you do the linearization, you actually compute just partial derivatives, and then you evaluate them at the equilibrium, okay? At the equilibrium. And for two by two metrics, how do you decide? Determine and trace. That's kind of a nice, easy thing, right? If the term is positive, This means the eigenvalues have the same sign, right? Because the determinant is the product of the eigenvalues. And the trace is the sum of the eigenvalues. So if the trace is negative, it means they both have the same sign and they add up to something negative. So they have to both be negative. So it means that equilibrium is A, both negative eigenvalues, sink, right? Things go in. And that, that was on the picture, right? Uh, uh, for the second one, you actually end up with the determinant being negative. And if the term is negative, do you have to do anything else to conclude the nature of that? Determinant negative means product of the eigenvalues is negative means the eigenvalues are of opposite signs, right? So one is positive, one is negative, so you have a saddle. And you see it in that picture, right? And I think the only thing is, for A equals one quarter, you have to do that separately. Uh, where is the... I don't even think I do it. Well, I do it here. If A is one quarter and you look at the determinant, you end up with a determinant equal to zero. What does it mean, determinant equal to zero? About eigenvalues? One of them has to be zero, right? And that by itself is not necessarily a guarantee that solutions will actually go away. Okay, that's sort of a degenerate case. Um, in fact, for the linear system, what happens when you have a zero eigenvalue? Remember, you have a bunch of equilibria. It's not just zero, the only equilibrium, right? You have a bunch of equilibrium in the direction of the eigenvector to that eigenvalue zero. But for nonlinear system, you see it's, it's no longer something guaranteed. Why? Because the nonlinear picture is just an, or the linear picture is just an approximation of the nonlinear picture at near that equilibrium, right? But things could be totally, I mean, could be dead different. Seems to me like even in the closest vicinity to that point, the ones on the right side aren't going to go to the equilibrium point. On this side? Uh, on this side? side? No, they, they're going to go away, right. right. But in the linearization mode, they do. They, they stop right there. Yeah. So even in the vicinity, it's not a. Right. It's not a conjugate. They're not conjugate, no. Totally true. Uh, we'll, we'll, so conjugacy is a very strong... Conjugacy means one looks like the other, right? In, more or less. Uh, behavior is similar, right? So no, exactly exactly right. So when you have uh, eigenvalue zero or imag purely imaginary, then it's, uh, it's uh, anything could happen. Yeah. 
any situation. Yeah. True. Yeah. Well, oh, between this and that, sure. But between this and the linearization, uh, for the linearization, I said there are infinitely many. In fact, I can bet you that the linearization, the eigenvector for eigenvalue zero, will actually be either this direction or this direction. I'm not sure. You think it's this direction? Yeah. I don't know. It could also be this direction. This direction? Okay. Now, the best the best way to for me to uh, um, of course we could just run this really quick. But this is why uh, it kind of makes uh, a lot of sense to think about the linearization around an equilibrium as being an approximation of the full picture, nonlinear picture, is that think about uh, every time you get a different error. Um, I don't know, this, this looks like a nonlinear system to you, right? So let's just Okay, so you see, uh, okay, I mean, that looks like nice, but let me, let me do that, uh, the one I showed you. What was it, x squared plus y, x minus, x minus y plus a, a equals, I said zero, not one quarter. Okay, so, See, I can look the, for this equilibrium, and it automatically gives me this linearization, right? And when I display it, yeah, of course, it uh, gives you this errors. But you're right. The uh, the direction of the that that's just numerical error, right? Because it should you see the direction field. So this should be the one where it's actually lots of equilibrium, right? But this is, I mean, we call this a degenerate case or a singular case. It's like, it's like when the metric says determinant zero, right? You have to deal with the rank. Um, so uh, there's always very nice, well, there, there are always easier things to uh, say when you have, uh, now it never stops, right? Ah, I lost that. Do nothing. Let okay, I me mean, do nothing here. Um, I'm sorry. Okay. So let's take a equals zero. So we have two equilibria. And you see around each equilibrium, the linearization, oh, I think I lost that now. Uh, the linearization is going to be, which I can plot. Think about it as some sort of, well, it is true that if if you imagine that uh, a nonlinear figure like some sort of on top of a mountain okay so that's the peak all right and a saddle means it's actually it's a saddle but uh, that's how those paths are going right uh, like water is flowing right right it's coming from so imagine that these actually are high altitude so water just comes in but you know eventually goes in the lower altitude, right? Lower, uh, okay? Um, and if, if you are uh, watching from the top of the, from the airplane, then you will actually see the linearization, okay? 
that deformation is because of the terrain, because of the, how the heights is and, and stuff like that is, right? It's the same thing for a valley. I mean, think about a, this is a valley, right? We said it's a sink, so it should be a point where it's like everything goes towards it. Right? So, think about this deformation as being really coming from different altitudes at which, you know, these curves uh, exist. But if you're, if you're looking from the top, like uh, you're looking on the tangent plane to the surface, then you would see the linearization, okay? So, and of course, if you have several peaks, several valleys, well, around each peak and valley, you'll see this linearization, right? But uh, you don't see the connecting things between them, between the, the This was the default system. So here, it's if I look for a particular for a equilibrium, then we see a um, looks like it's spiraling out, right? That's what you see here. But then there are other equilibria, which I don't know if you can find them uh, explicitly. But these are this would be a repeated eigenvalue, right? This also is, is, is going out. And you see it's just the location of those equilibria in different places um, and the nature of the system that's nonlinear that actually can create all kinds of patterns. Okay? And we don't, you need, uh, you need some sort of understanding of this creation of these patterns. Um, so I'll try, I'll skip for now the. Um, um, I mean, there is there. There are two th important things that that one should um, uh, hopefully you can read this. Um, what we talked so far about sinks for a nonlinear system, right? We said that if the linearization looks like it's a sink, right? Then the nonlinear uh, equilibrium, the equilibrium for the original system is also a sink, right? But this needs a proof, really. So the proof is actually in that uh, conjugacy. So, so if uh, x star is an equilibrium for the nonlinear system, so we're going to talk about that's going to be our, our goal. Uh, such that the matrix, the Jacobian, so that's the linearization, right, has two um, eigenvalues, well, has eigenvalues with negative parts, eigenvalues with negative real parts, which means that the linearization has a sink, right, at u equals zero. You agree with that? Then x star is um, a nonlinear sink, meaning, well, it's a sink, okay, but it's uh, meaning uh, that solutions approach or converge to x star as t goes to infinity, provided the initial condition x0 is close to x star. Okay? So you see, you don't have to have, you don't have to be a sink for a nonlinear system uh, Uh, I mean, you don't qualify as a sink if not all solutions go towards you, like you saw in the in, the, in those uh, examples. 
this still is a sink. Uh, not in this one, but in the previous one. I have the picture here. Where's my picture? You know what I'm talking about, right? So it's the... Uh... Yeah. See, this guy here is a sink, right? Although, points here don't go there, right? But only in the neighborhood of this point, everything should go in. Okay, how do you prove such, such, uh, such a thing? Well, um, I will skip this. It's actually, uh, you have a sketch of a proof here in the, um, uh, in the book. It basically talks about uh, making this system near the equilibrium to be nonlinear system, to be conjugate to its linearization. So it turns out, so more in, it turns out that um, x prime equals f of x for x near x star and u prime equals df of x star that's the linearization right and here u is say near zero are conjugate okay I won't have time to really do that um, today but it's basically the same ideas you know you have to basically f uh, find a target not circle but neighborhood of that point and show that solutions of a nonlinear system actually enter that and never leave okay it's the same as as they did f as we did for um, um, when you had a spiraling in and some other situation like uh, repeated eigenvalues going towards zero. Okay. Well, that's not the only uh, way to actually get this um, correspondence between the linear system, the linearization, and the, the full system. Uh, it's also true if, if they all have positive eigenvalues, right? That would be a source. Right? Nonlinear source. DF of X star should be has eigenvalues with positive real parts. Why I'm not saying just positive? Because it could actually be spiraling out as with having some uh, complex eigenvalues. Okay? Um, nonlinear saddles is actually also true. So what's a what's a saddle? A saddle is something that, when you linearize, well, what's a manifestation of a saddle? When you linearize, if 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 there is eigenvalue with positive real parts and with negative real parts, but no. Sorry, this is DF, that's the Jacobian. Has no, uh, actually has positive and negative real parts. So it has eigenvalues with positive and negative real parts, but no purely imaginary eigenvalues. So in other words, it's a hyperbolic, right? Remember how we call hyperbolic system? So the linearization will look like in this direction going in and this direction going out, right? Now, if you are to ask yourselves, this is the linearization. But how about the nonlinear? Well, there is a, a, 
there is a proof, there is a theorem which says, and it spans four pages on your book, which says that if there are no purely imaginary eigenvalues, right, and there are some positive and some negative, then what's going to happen? <coughs> this picture is just going to get deformed, but it's going to preserve it, so it's going to be conjugate, right? To the, the linearization. And there's going to be this very important direction, but it's not going to be a direction, it's going to be a curve along which solutions will go towards that saddle. Okay? But it's not a straight line anymore because it's a nonlinear system. But it's going to be, and this is going to call the stable curve. Okay? And again, I'm not proving here anything, but I'm just. And there is another curve on which things will go away in the sense that towards negative infinity it goes back towards that point. It's going to be unstable. And then of course everything else is going to kind of follow this pattern. So. Nothing really gets attracted to that point except the points on the stable curve. So that's a very small set of initial conditions. Okay? But these are conjugate. So, so the, the key is that conjugate. Okay? Proof is, is a lot more complicated. Okay? So the last thing that I want to do is, I have five minutes, um, is to talk a little bit about bifurcations. So. Just like in that um, just like in the um, example in that homework problem, um, you can actually get uh, a variety of bifurcations. Um, and I have this handout which I, I won't write anymore, but there are many types of bifurcations in the plane. And notice time independent, right? We're not, we don't talk about time dependent problems. So, depending on how this system looks, um, or actually the specific, uh, the specific system that we're, we're concerned about, for example, let's take the first one. That's x, x prime equals x squared plus lambda. Can I call it a in this? And minus y. Now, what you notice here is that this is a decoupled system, okay? Or I think the book uses product system. It's, um, it's decoupled, so you can actually even try to solve it. So it's not the point is that we don't necessarily want. I'm sorry, I have to define what a is. Let's say a is zero for f first. Well, x a is one. Okay. I mean, the fact that it's decoupled is just easy for you to kind of say, oh, yeah, that's why this is, right? Because y prime is negative y means the y is kind of getting smaller, right? Exponentially small. But x is, x prime is x squared plus 1, so it's going to infinity, right? So the combination of them gives you this, this pattern. And you say that's fine, right? That corresponds to the range where, where a or lambda is positive. Right? So you see in my picture here, when, it, when you draw a phased, I mean a bifurcation diagram, I actually like to call, um, draw this lambda or a um, on an axis and sort of indicate the points where bifurcations occur for, those param for that parameter. So it turns out that uh, lambda equals zero, is gonna, something's gonna change. How do you do this by hand? Well, you just have to find the equilibria, right? Obviously, y equals zero, and if a is positive or lambda is positive, then there's going to be no equilibrium. But if a is negative, there's going to be two equilibrium, right? And then look at what is each like. And you see in my picture, I say one is a saddle and one is a sink. Okay. So, if you want to convince yourself, you just change the value of a or lambda to be negative one, right? And you can see the sink, right? And you can see the saddle. Okay? 
So now what happens is you get closer to zero. Zero point, I mean negative point zero one. What do you think happens? The, the sink kind of merge, gets closer and closer to the saddle, right? Still a sink and a saddle too, but they're very close to each other. So you see the, that picture, and it's just kind of a suggestive. You can maybe come up with a better way of doing it. Um, it's just the two uh, equilibria kind of eventually merge when lambda equal when, I, when a or lambda equals zero. At that point, what kind of equilibrium it is? Well, you have to do the math and figure it out, um, or you can try this, you know, face portrait. Looks to me like you see the semi-stable, right? Because on this side is going in, and the other side it goes out. Okay. So that's called actually a saddle node bifurcation. And in the book you actually see, have this worked out for just one equation. Instead of two equations, instead of a system of two equations. It's one equation. Okay. It doesn't make that much sense when you have only one equation, but I would suggest you, you, look, you, you read that. Um, there is another type of application called pitchfork, which I guess is because the picture looks, look, look, looks like a fork. Um, but what happens when lambda is negative? You end up with three equilibria. And then when you analyze each of them with the Jacobian, you see that two of them are sinks, and a third one is a saddle. Well, as you, as you vary that parameter lambda, you will see that the saddle stays where it, where it, where it is, I think at the origin, zero, zero. But the sinks are actually moving towards the origin. When lambda is zero, only one equilibrium exists, and that's probably semi-stable or something. When lambda is positive, right, it's a cubic equation, it always has a zero. So there is one equilibrium, and it turns out to be a, a sink too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's no equilibrium. So in this bifurcation, in this particular three first three bifurcations or two two bifurcations, we're concerned. We we really want to see what the face portrait looks like, right? And typically the equilibrium are the signatures, right? I mean the first thing to look for. But now look at number three, and number three is kind of peculiar. So. But, but it's probably, you don't have to do any, any pictures to, to realize. This is a linear system in which there is a parameter there, right? And you s certainly see when lambda is zero, that this is x prime equals y, y prime equals minus x. This is those periodic solutions, the circles, rotation. So you have lots of periodic solutions, which you don't have if lambda is negative nor positive. If lambda is negative, you can convince yourself. Uh, compute the eigenvalues. Well, compute the, uh, excuse me, the, there's only one equilibrium at zero, right? And then, then things are spiraling in, so it's a sink. For lambda is positive, it's, uh, things are spiraling out, so it's a source, right? So there's always one equilibrium, and that's the origin, but when lambda is zero, there are all these periodic solutions that just pop up, right? And that's kind of peculiar, but the next one is actually the typical one. It's, it has this long name, which is, you know, big names here, Poincaré, Andro, Andronov, Hopf. Think about this one, and now uh, do the face portrait. And I, I, I don't have uh, time. Can I ask you to do, actually, that's part of the homework, is uh, I think there are two problems in Chapter 8, uh, eight that I assigned. Plus, basically doing this, did I say here? Yeah. For each system, find equilibrium linearization um, around equilibria as a function of this parameter. Then discuss the bifurcation diagram by plotting a few representative phase portraits for different lambdas. Okay. So what will you see in this uh, half bifurcation thing? When lambda is negative, you're going to see just one equilibrium and everything going towards it. Right? Boring. Right? 
But as lambda changes, it, it's I'm not sure. Actually, no, it's going to be at zero. But it's possible. It's possible that this sync node changes with the parameter. In this case, it doesn't. But when lambda is positive, what happens? Well, zero zero is still, uh, I think, uh, an equilibrium, but it certainly starts seeing periodic solutions, and not not a lot, but just one. Okay. Um, one other thing that I didn't mention here is many of this, and the worst, uh, the, the, well, there's one called Homo Clinic. That's kind of the most difficult one. So I would just say use the P plan and explore this and say, see if you can say anything about it. Um, I would say there's something we haven't talked, um, but it's how you can represent this in polar coordinates sometimes. So for, for Poincare, Andronov, and the Homo Clinic, these two can be converted to polar coordinates. So make that note. Uh, it might give you more insight, actually. Uh, when you do polar coordinates, um, you can see basically r and theta, right? So you can see things like if you have periodic, periodic orbit, right? r is just constant and theta it changes with time. Um, or maybe r is not constant, but r is periodic. So there are things you can... So these two can be converted to, uh, to polar coordinates. Right? One is x squared plus y squared. That's r squared. Um, but anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll. For now, I think it would be the, the task is is the task clear? Find equilibria and I'm solve those by hand. I mean, again, for number two, you'd have to solve a th cubic equation, but you can factor that, right? Um, and use p plane to plot a few face portraits for for different variables of lambda. Okay, so I'll li I, I made this homework uh, due, I think, um, Wednesday. So, so if you have questions, you can ask Monday. In fact, Monday, I mean, uh, I'll, I'll briefly show you how to use polar coordinates. I mean, there there are some examples in the book that I haven't talked about, but um, okay. And then we